Everyone, I believe some of us have met. My name is Pastor Matt Vogt. I serve currently as a mission counselor for the, the western half of the United States and Canada. Um, had the opportunity to share God's word with you a couple times over the last couple of years. Um, I am happy to announce, many of you guys already know, uh, but this past week, this, this past Tuesday, I had lunch with your new pastor, uh, Pastor Barb Brower, down in Arizona. Um, I know him well. He was uh, three years younger than me back in college. So when he was the second string quarterback and I was the first string corner back, to try to, to guard his passes. So um, got a solid guy. I'm really, really excited for you and for him and his family. So, um, but this morning, in the meantime, until he arrives uh, in uh, the new year, uh, I am here today, and uh, of course, Pastor Lang will be back next week. Uh, the focus of our worship, I being the mission counselor, may be expected, um, reaching out with the gospel. All right? uh, that mission that Jesus has given us, and we'll look particularly at his great commissioning words in Matthew chapter 28 to go and make disciples of, of all nations. With that in mind and in heart, we begin with uh, the first uh, hymn, uh, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. May the Lord bless our worship today. Bless the Lord. 
Be in our worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our relationship with God depends on his mercy, for he is holy, and we are sinful. Let us now seek his mercy by confessing our sins and appealing to his grace. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. Lord, you are righteous. But this day we are covered with shame because of our unfaithfulness to you. We have not obeyed you or kept the laws you gave us through your servants, the prophets. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servants. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. Out of his great love for us, our God has had mercy on us. For the sake of the suffering, death, and resurrection of his Son, Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from the power of sin, death, and the devil. As a called servant of Jesus Christ and by his command and authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In this peace of forgiveness, we praise you, O Lord. pray. 
Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. As mentioned before, our theme is going and sharing that message, being disciples and making disciples of all nations. And while this is a command of Jesus at the end of his ministry, after having accomplished all of that, the Bible makes it clear in our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah says that too, that this has always been God's plan, God's intent. He is the one and only true God and the one and only Savior of all nations. And how beautiful are the feet of those who, who do that work and, and share that message. We read, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Our lesson from the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 also reminds us of this, that we have been chosen by God made holy by him, treasured by him. And the response of the heart so treasured, so loved, is to to share that love with others, to sing our Savior's praises and to proclaim them that others may come to know and appreciate and enjoy what it is that we have in Jesus. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which weigh war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our gospel message, which will also be the basis of this morning's sermon, familiar words, and the words of Jesus in his great commission, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So are the words of our Savior. We'll have a children's message this morning. I know it's a little different. We don't all gather around for things like this today, but um, for the kids... I need a show of hands as to how many of you are going to school. Okay. Now, keep your hand up if you are going to school to go to school. All right. So some of you aren't so much going to school. There's lots of kids who are going to school. You can put your hands down. There's lots of kids that are going to school but not going to school to go to school. Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about, right? If not now, you probably had to do it back in the spring. You had to go to school, but stay in your house. You had to go to school, but, but go to school on your kitchen table or in your bedroom or at grandma and grandpa's house. Um, today, you actually, you could probably even go to school out at the park or at the store or w- wherever you got internet access. Kids are going to school, right? We are talking today about being Jesus' disciples and making disciples. You know, remember, think of who the disciples were. Those were Jesus' friends. They were Jesus' followers. But do you know what the word disciple means? 
The disciples were Jesus' students. They were learners. To disciple means to, to learn, right? So the disciples were Jesus' students. And where did Jesus teach his students? Did Jesus have a school that the disciples had to sit in class with him? No. Jesus taught his disciples when they were just they were walking along from one place to another. Jesus taught his disciples sometimes out on a boat, out on the lake. Jesus taught his disciples in town when he's working a miracle on the side of a, of a hill someplace, right? Jesus was able to teach his disciples where, you know, in all sorts of places, and, and we can too, right? You learn about Jesus at church. Maybe you learned about Jesus at, a, at our school, at a Christian school. Maybe you learn about Jesus at Sunday school, but you also can learn about Jesus when mom and dad talk to you about Jesus or teach some lessons at home. You learn about Jesus anywhere you've got a Bible. In fact, you don't even need a Bible anymore, right? With your computer, with your phone. The Bible's right there. We can learn from Jesus in all sorts of places today. And the point of today's lesson is that Jesus wants us to be disciples, not just in church on Sunday, not just at Christian school, on, but he wants us to be his disciples when we're at the store, when we're at home, when we're at the park, right? Because being disciples of Jesus is something that doesn't just, isn't something you just do when you're around church. We are disciples of Jesus everywhere we go. And Jesus uses that, right, to make disciples of others as we show love and kindness and patience and forgiveness and, and gentleness and, you know, and control and, and right? Those are all things that Jesus works in us right? and Jesus uses to, to teach others. Right? There's a lot of people who are going to first learn about Jesus, not by reading the Bible, but by reading you, right? watching how you live and walk and, and treat others and talk to your parents and take care of your friends and your brothers and sisters. They learn about Jesus by by watching and reading, learning from you, right? Jesus says, you are my disciples to make disciples of others. Right? Thank you. Right? Let's offer a short prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for being, making us your disciples, for being our Savior and calling us to faith and teaching us day in and day out and through your word and sending your Holy Spirit into our hearts for that. We also thank you as we continue to grow to learn about you, that we also grow in being able to live like you. We pray that you would let others learn about you as they come to know us and to know that we are one of your disciples. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our worship with the singing of the next hymn, um, hymn 573, but I believe it's up here, Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying. Or 283.
Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. As mentioned before, our, our sermon is based off the gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 28. And we will refer to those words in, in a few moments. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the TV show Undercover Boss. The idea behind the show is that some high-level executive, usually a CEO or the vice president of the company, assumes a different identity, and for three, four days, uh, in a variety of different roles and different locations throughout his company, he, he goes undercover. Right? The thought of it is this, that that high-level executive cannot, does not understand how the decisions that he makes in his, his cushy corporate office affect the people on the front lines of the business. Only by going undercover, only by spending time doing those tasks, interacting as a peer with those fellow employees, is he really able to understand what's going on? Is he really able to understand what those employees are experiencing, how they're feeling, what they're thinking about things. That executive usually comes back from that experience with a, a fresh perspective, and it, it leads to some significant changes in how he goes about making his decisions and providing leadership for that company. And very often he also comes back much more relatable to his employees and and his leadership is much more relevant to the needs of his company and those who are working in it relatable and relevant those are things that we as disciples of christ as ambassadors of the gospel want to be and or become right, in our relationship with those around us. Relatable and relevant to the unchurched, the de churched, the unbelievers in our lives, with the prayer that the gospel itself becomes relatable and relevant to, to many of them. The words of our lesson today are familiar words, right? perhaps some of the most familiar in the Bible, Jesus' great commission. And yet I invite you to, to look at them anew with me today. Right? Because in these words, Jesus is calling on us to live every day of our lives intentionally as the disciples of the Savior of all nations that he in his grace has called us to be. As we reflect on these words, we think about why that is necessary. Why do we need to, to put in the work of, of becoming relatable not only relating ourselves, but relating the gospel to others. And, and again, that goes back to this, this commission, that God in his grace has said, as, a, as beneficiaries of my grace, you are now to be ambassadors of my grace. You are to be embodiments of that truth of the gospel, so that by living out the love of Jesus, those around you will not miss out on the grace of God. Go and make disciples of all nations, Jesus says. Right? And Jesus knows full well that, that each one of us has our own personal, cultural identity and familiarity. And yet in spite of that, he says, go and make disciples of, of all nations. Not just those who look like us, think like us, act like us, but, but all people of all nations. Right? And again, this takes work. It's take, it takes work because... The lives that we live today as 21st century Christians is in many ways altogether different from those who do not know and enjoy that relationship with God that we have through faith in Him. That we live two entirely different cultural contexts. I mean, yes, we drive the same streets, we eat similar foods, we work similar jobs, we, we hike the same nature trails, we might even enjoy many of the same forms of entertainment. But our perspective on life, right? our, our, our priorities, the way that we handle and approach the different things that we come into contact with day in and day out could not be more different. Right? We 
have an altogether different perspective, not only on eternity, but on the things that, that we deal with day in and day out. And the Bible uses some very stark contrast to illustrate this difference. The Holy Spirit uses contrasts like light and darkness, day and night, sight and blindness, ignorance and wisdom, even life and death to, to demonstrate just how different we are and our lives are as Christians from, from an unbeliever. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the book of Philippians. Many live as enemies of, cross of, Christ, of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever find yourself struggling to relate to someone who is quite different from you? If you're a parent or a married individual, do you struggle to relate with, with someone who is single? If you're older, do you struggle to relate to and, and, and have a conversation with a teenager or a millennial, or vice versa if you're younger? Grandparents here today, you know, do you struggle to have a, 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 a meaningful relationship or a, a, an extended conversation with your grandkids? So foreign, so different can be trying to relate to an unbeliever or, or them to us. But that doesn't mean that you don't try, right? Grandma, Grandpa, you, your efforts might fall woefully short, but you're still going to seek to develop that relationship. Why? Because you, you want to have that relationship with your grandkids because you, you love them. Well, think of some of those principles that you have adopted. Think of some of those tactics that you have attempted to relate to someone who's altogether different from you. And then listen again to Jesus' words, go and make disciples of all nations, right? Apply some of those same principles. Take some of those same steps in seeking to relate to the unbeliever, to understand where they're coming from. Why do we do this? Because God cares for them. The fact that God has placed you into their life is evidence of that fact. Jesus has lived and died and risen for them. God the Holy Spirit has brought you to them or them to you and promises to give you the words to say, when the opportunity arises. God, in His grace, has placed us here for a reason. He's given us this charge, go and make disciples of all nations. And perhaps I, I could suggest a book or two or three that you could read to, to, to relate and understand the mindset of, of the unbeliever in our world today. And you might be surprised that the evidence suggests that they are far less offended by having a conversation with someone like you than you might, you might believe. But perhaps the best advice I could give, instead of recommending a book or a YouTube documentary that you can watch, is simply this. Listen. Just listen. You might be surprised what you learn about them. Listen to understand what their worries, their fears, their concerns, their hopes, their regrets are. Listen so that in time you can develop a relationship where mutual respect and trust exist. Listen so that you earn the right to be heard. Listen so that you know what to say when you are given the right to say something. And, and be relatable. A lot of people have an impression of us as Christians that we are either holier than thou's or that we're a bunch of hypocrites. We need to be relatable. We need to be open and honest about our own struggles, our fears, our concerns, our frustrations. We need to be able to relate and understand, open up and be transparent about our own our own weaknesses, about the times that we have been tested in our faith, the times that we have been less than, than we know we can and should be as the disciples of Christ and followers of Jesus, the times we have had to flee to the Lord in prayer and to His Word for comfort, for, 
forgiveness, for our own healing, for encouragement, for hope. Right. Be relatable. Right. I'm not saying empty your closet of all of its skeletons to everyone that you meet, but, but in the right circumstances, again, let them know how much you need and appreciate Jesus as your Savior from your sin. Perhaps you've heard this statistic before, but you know that, that 85% of people who come to church the first time come because a friend, a relative, an acquaintance of some kind invited them. Only 5% of people come the first time because of the pastor. So do the math. That makes you 17 times more effective as an evangelist than the pastor is. Why is that? It's because you as an, an everyday run-of-the-mill Christian are much more relatable. An invitation from you goes a whole lot further than an invitation by the pastor to come and listen to me preach to you tomorrow morning. That relatability is something that you have going for you that, that some of the best of our called missionaries don't. In fact, we as a church cannot afford to outsource outreach to our called gospel servants. And put that another way. We cannot afford to have the mindset, though, if I give my offerings, then I can walk away feeling I've done my job as a gospel witness because I am paying the pastor and the teachers who are the paid professionals. That is simply not how God has designed or history has demonstrated that going and making disciples of all nations works. God invites and sends out each one of us to go and make disciples of all nations. And speaking of going, going and making disciples does not mean build a church, send out a bunch of invitations, and hope that people show up. For most people today who are not already in, the church is irrelevant. They're not interested in invitation to church or to a church function. What they are interested in is, is a conversation about, about God. Right? They would welcome a spiritual conversation from someone whom they trust. They're not so much interested in learning about the church or organized religion, but they are still today interested in learning about Jesus. Again, what an opportunity that we have and that God has given us, not only the words to say, but the heart with which to say it. He's made it clear that this is an, a, a command, a charge, that, that has no expiration date. Just like his promise has no expiration date. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our prayer as 21st century Christians is that the Lord would lead us to, to embrace his invitation. To join the Apostle Paul in saying, pray. Pray that I may proclaim the gospel clearly as I should. But then who also went on to say, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That's why this sermon is entitled Live as the Disciples of the Savior of All Nations and not Make Disciples of All Nations. Right. Making disciples, finally, that's God's job. Right? He works through the gospel as we baptize and teach to actually change that heart. Right. But the best way in which we carry out our role is by going out there and, and rubbing shoulders metaphorically with people outside these walls, right? creating the environment, creating the opportunity through which then we can baptize and teach, right? creating the curiosity right? in which people then are, are eager to learn more about the source of the love that lives inside of us. Right? That's always been God's plan. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Doctrinal statements and public confessions of faith are hard to relate to. But lives 
modeled after the love of a loving Savior. Fruits of faith like love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and, and gentleness and, and self-control, those are relatable. And they arouse a curiosity. People don't want to know what the source of that is. And then, then we can be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Then we baptize and teach. It's always been God's plan, and increasingly so in our world today. There's a big challenge, of course, and it's not so much out there. There's a big challenge that exists right in here. Each one of us has a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is going to lead us, like it leads everyone else, to live very self-centered lives. A sinful nature that is going to justify whatever selfish choices we make, either individually or as a gathering of believers in a congregation. But what we also have as Christians that not everyone else has is the fact that we, we as Christians march to the beat of a different drum. We got the blood of another coursing through our spiritual veins, and that blood is the blood of Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That drumbeat is that of the Lord and of his army, his church. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. This isn't merely a command that God gives. It's a promise that he makes. Jesus' command is not uh, strive to become my witnesses, but you are my witnesses. You are ambassadors of the gospel. You are the light of the world. Redeemed, forgiven, washed clean of our sin in the blood of Jesus, renewed, restored, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Go, right, as his disciples, right, that the Lord might use us to make disciples of others. One other question, though, is, is the gospel still relevant, right? Is the message of forgiven sins, a relationship with our divine creator based on his unconditional love, a life that has meaning and value and purpose, lasting purpose, a place of eternal rest and peace as the destiny for the human soul, are those messages that are all relevant in a 21st century postmodern scientific world? I invite you to ask the troubled souls in your life. Those are truths, those are messages that have never been more necessary, more sought after, more desired than they are today. It is said that we are currently sharing the planet with the two loneliest generations in the history of the world. And statistics related to it, statistics related to, to depression and substance abuse and suicide are off the charts. And this was true well before COVID, and it's, it's only more so today. God and His grace is is a relevant God right? who has a relevant message, a message of forgiveness and peace and love and life. Right? You and I live it, you and I bask in it, we enjoy it, and there are far too many others that we, because perhaps it's been a long time or ever since we've lived in that world, don't understand the beauty and the wonders of such truths that are the foundation of our being. Going and making disciples of others. These are, this is not some 21st century church growth missional philosophy. This is, these are cherished principles of the Lutheran church going all the way back to Martin Luther himself. Right? We'll be celebrating the Reformation next weekend. If there was anybody who could have remained religiously distant and aloof. It would have been a former monk, now Bible professor at some esteemed university. But in his translating of the Bible into the language of the people, the, the German language, 
which in and of itself demonstrated a, a, a radical desire to share Jesus with, with every man. Martin Luther did his, some of his research by going down to the marketplace and just hanging out, talking to and listening to other conversations, listening to how people were talking, what the words they were using, the phrases that they used to communicate things. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to use those same words, those same phrases, to communicate the words, the teachings, the concepts of the Bible. Martin Luther was comfortable in, in talking to kings, but also to barbers, right? to, to society's elite as well as to little children. He could write dissertations in multiple languages, but he also could write a, a letter to his own son talking about heaven in terms of walking amongst the apple trees and riding ponies. Martin Luther wrote hymns filled with biblical meaning and, you know, and, and, and doctrinal theology, but he set many of them to familiar tunes, even bar songs that the people were familiar with and would enjoy singing. And this isn't just a Lutheran principle. Jesus himself enjoyed making himself to be, to be known as the source of God's love and, and the Savior of all nations. You read the Gospels and countless examples of him sharing the Gospel with people from a variety of backgrounds and cultures. You see him calling out and holding up a Samaritan woman as, as a living example of grace in action and pointing to a Roman centurion as evidence of, of faith, the, the greatest that he had seen in all of Israel. He taught a parable in which he demonstrated who the message of the gospel was for by sending out a master, sending out his servants onto the street corners, down the country lanes, into the marketplace to extend that invitation to the heavenly banquet. Jesus was referred to as a glutton and a drunkard. Right? Nothing could be further from the truth, but the basis of that accusation was that Jesus spent most of his time here on earth not with the priests and the rabbis and the religiously elite, but with society's outcast and downcast, with the poor and the widows, with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Jesus strove hard to be and make that message of the gospel relatable and relevant to the souls that he had a chance to, to meet in person, right? And now, today, he sends us out to do the same. In Jesus, you and I have a Savior who is God, eternal Son, who by nature could, could be no more distant from us. He being holy, separated from sin and sinners. But in, in the wonder of his grace, Jesus has made himself known to you. Relatable and, and relevant to your life not only eternity, but in so many ways, day in and day out. It is my prayer that, that God will lead you to, to embrace this call, right? to grab a hold of this charge, to take him up on his invitation to now go right? and, and make that message relatable. Right? Make that message relevant. Share the joys of others. God can use you in small and yet amazing ways to make disciples of others. To Him be the glory. Amen. I invite you to please rise. We'll now confess this Christian faith of ours in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. Heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Dear gracious Lord God, Lord of the Church, we thank and praise you for that gift of forgiveness, that gift of salvation, the gift of faith by which we come to enjoy and embrace these wonders that are ours under your grace. We thank you for those that you have used in our own lives to bring and then continue to confirm that gospel upon us. We pray that you would lead us to increasingly grow in our appreciation for the role that you would have us play in our world and in the lives of those that you have, have put into our life. We pray that you would lead us all the more to appreciate the value of the light in the midst of the darkness and to cause that light to shine brightly. We pray that you would allow our conversations to be full of grace and seasoned with salt. We pray that you would allow our days to be filled with those fruits of the Spirit and that you might then use them to create an audience by which we may then have the opportunity to communicate your love in your words of salvation. We pray for those missionaries and pastors and teachers who, who go out of their way and go in places that we ourselves cannot go. We appreciate the work that you have and continue to accomplish through them. We also pray that you would lead us to recognize each one of us, our roles as missionaries, the place that you have placed us in, the lives that you seek to reach and to touch through the lives that we live. Each one of us now brings before you an individual in our homes, on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, that we particularly pray that you would create an opportunity, that you would open the door for us to witness of your love. With them in mind, dear Lord, we now also come before you, offering our prayers and praying as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Do this. 
Shut 